Okay, so John Oliver on his show last week tonight on HBO dedicated an entire episode to Venezuela in the week leading up to its election. Um, now, this is really no big deal because basically every major media and news outlet ran their own stories uh, talking about how terrible of a place Venezuela was and how much of a failure its government was leading up to the election. So this really was nothing different than any other media outlet was doing. But because John Oliver is considered such a big progressive voice that reaches millions of progressive-minded people, I thought it was important to address uh, the many, many problems uh, and distortions in this report um, that so many people have been talking about. In fact, I've heard this episode referenced more than any other news story about Venezuela and its government, both before and after the election. So let's get started with it. But what is happening in Venezuela is not just extremely important, it is absolutely worth paying attention to, because this is not just a story about socialism. There are plenty of socialist countries that look nothing like Venezuela. It's a story about epic mismanagement. Right off the bat, he kind of says what he's going to show in this entire episode, is that the story of Venezuela is just a story of epic mismanagement by the Maduro government. So he's setting out from the beginning uh, what he wants you to think in this piece and what he's going to prove. So epic that a nation of 31 million people with the largest oil reserves in the world have been forced to resort to some pretty creative forms of protest. Social media ablaze for the past few days encouraging protesters to fill jars and bags with human feces. This is one of our last options, says this masked man. We are calling it Poopoo Top Cocktails. Yes, Poopoo Top Cocktails. That is funny because, you know, it's poop. It, it is also desperate people resorting to a desperate measure. So he says there that this is desperate people referring to desperate measures. Um, we're going to get in a little later uh, into the reality of that protest movement. Um, but one of the things he says here is it's desperate people resorting to desperate measures. What he fails to mention is that uh, the most desperate people in Venezuela, meaning the people that are among the poorest people um, and the ones that are suffering most from food shortages and levels of poverty and things like that, those are the sectors that predominantly support the government. And while the sectors that predominantly oppose the government, you know, those desperate people resorting to desperate measures are from the upper and upper middle classes in Venezuelan society. And this is reflected across the board from voter turnout to where the protests are held uh, and things of that nature. And so a characterization that these are the, the desperate people, um, is they're, they're desperate for other reasons. Which, which we'll get into later. Their current president, Nicolas Maduro, seen here absolutely going to town on a nana, <laughs> is almost certainly going to win despite having the support of only around a fifth of the population. This is a perfect example of how John Oliver is twisting facts in this episode. He uses this quote from Reuters to show Maduro has low support. I was curious to see what words were missing from this abbreviated quote, so I went to the source. It turns out the quote isn't saying that he has low support but that in fact, despite criticisms, he nevertheless has the core support of one-fifth of the population. Core support meaning die-hard, firm supporters that are campaigning for him, active in politics, etc. That's pretty impressive, and doesn't include the millions of Maduro voters who aren't considered, quote, core support. Of course, many more than one-fifth of the voting population came out to vote for Maduro on May 20th. The line is immediately followed by a quote from a Venezuelan saying while he acknowledges that mistakes have been made, he'll still be voting for Maduro to prevent the opposition from turning back the clock on their social gains. Pretty disingenuous, John. And to understand anything about present-day Venezuela, you really have to start with Maduro's predecessor, Hugo Chavez, shown here looking understandably smug about the fact that he's got a bird in a hat on his shoulder. <laughs> John Oliver is right to know that we have to look at the Chavez era to understand what's going on today. But really to understand what's going on in Venezuela, you obviously don't have to start with Chavez. You have to start with the period before Chavez. Venezuela is a victim of what's been called 500 years of social disaster. It was uh, in 1499, the era of colonialism began when it was invaded by the Spanish Empire. And Venezuela, like every other colonized country in the world, suffered genocide and was transformed into a monocrop slave state to be devoured by foreign powers while the people of the country uh, went deeper and deeper into poverty and misery uh, and death. That legacy of underdevelopment still plagues every formerly colonized country in the world trying to emerge uh, in today's economy and oh, having to overcome that legacy of having one export, uh, not having any infrastructure and things of that nature. So that says a lot about where Venezuela is today. And then when neoliberal reforms hit the countries uh, in the 80s, it devastated them just like it did every other country that was hit with these predatory neoliberal reforms. Poverty was close to 50%. 
Infant mortality was a shocking 20 per 1,000 births, and there was widespread illiteracy, among other problems. In 1989, the country was in total economic collapse, far greater than anything we see in Venezuela today. And when people rose up in protest, they were massacred by the right-wing government, which imposed martial law and murdered an estimated 4,000 civilians in just a matter of days. And it's out of that movement this great rebellion and anger in Venezuelan society that Chavez emerged as a leader, whose democratic election began one of the most profound transformations of a poor country seen anywhere in the world. And Chavez rising up out of this movement, out of this period of, of great hardship and great rebellion in the country, it wasn't just Chavez that emerged, it was a massive socialist movement that emerged, that mobilized a clear majority of people on a path away from extreme inequality, away from exploitation uh, and towards national sovereignty and charting their own path. So we can't understand Venezuela today without understanding what is in the very recent memory of Venezuela. Chavez was massively popular in Venezuela, beloved for both his generous social programs and his larger-than-life personality. Every Sunday, he staged marathon TV broadcasts that sometimes ran up to eight hours on his show, Aldo Presidente. The show featured special guests, dance numbers, and prize giveaways. So even though John Oliver says we can't understand Venezuela today without understanding Chavez, he doesn't tell us anything about Chavez except that he was uh, quirky on television and had dance numbers and interviewed Fidel Castro on his show and, and things like that. So really kind of mocking him from the outset without actually teaching the viewer uh, anything about this period he says is so important to understand to understand Venezuela today. Now, now, Chavez could act the way that he did because Venezuela was oil rich and over the course of his presidency he took more and more state control over their national oil company, enabling him to fund programs benefiting the poor. And when that company protested some of the changes that he was making, he responded by using his TV show to address its executives directly. I'm firing the following people. Mr. Juan Fernandez, you are fired from Petroleum of Venezuela. Eddie Ramirez, thank you very much. You are fired. All he says about this happening is that when they protested, he fired them on TV. Well, what were they protesting? Uh, they were protesting the democratic election of Hugo Chavez. And the way that they were protesting is that they shut down oil production in the country. So when you have over 95% of uh, income into the country from oil, shutting down the oil industry is a pretty major uh, act of protest. You're shutting down the entire country and the entire economy. And what was their demand in the protest? Their demand was that Chavez, democratically elected leader, step down from office. So yeah, he fired those people, he took back the oil industry, and then used the wealth from the oil industry instead of going into those pockets of those uh, very rich billionaire oil executives, uh, he then used them to revolutionize the country in ways that we'll get into. Now, now to, be fair, to be fair to Chavez, many of his social programs were initially effective. During his tenure, the poverty rate was nearly halved, and to this day, many Venezuelans revere Chavez to a dramatic degree. Okay, so I appreciate here that John Oliver uh, says he wants to be fair to Chavez and acknowledges that uh, many things did work, including reducing poverty in half. But let's really be fair to Chavez. And let's not just mention the one major thing you were forced to mention. So just a quick overview. Not only was poverty reduced by half, but extreme poverty fell from 17% to under 7%. Pensions for the elderly went from under 400,000 to over 2 million. Malnutrition, of course, talked about a lot today, fell from 21% to 2%. Unemployment fell from 17% to under 6% and cut the huge infant mortality rate in half. Children in school went from 6 million to 13 million and illiteracy was totally eradicated. Just to be fair. The late president's eyes are painted on public buildings as if watching over the revolution. This man even tattooing the eyes onto his forehead. That's the image, the eyes of our supreme commander, Hugo Rafael Chavez Frias. The eyes that see the world, the whole world. Now that is dedication right there. The only Chavista you will see in this entire 20 plus minute episode is the guy with Chavez's eyes tattooed on his head. That's the entire representation they're showing of the movement behind Chavez and the people that support him. Not about who they are today, how massive the movement of supporting him still is today, or anything about them and what their politics are. The fact that they're progressives, that they're socialists, that they're fighting for equality, for more democracy. The vast majority of Venezuelans love and revere Chavez, and this is reflected literally everywhere in the country. But you won't hear from them in this episode. I witnessed tens of thousands of people marching in pro-government actions, young activists leading progressive organizing campaigns, women in the poorest areas brilliantly vowing to defend their revolution against U.S. attacks, 
but you will not hear from any of them in this episode. And it's very revealing that this show does not want to show these Chavistas, who are clearly a huge part of the population and who constitute the country's most significant political force. Uh, it's all going to be reduced down to the craziest looking person they could find to make fun of and using that to represent uh, the massive social force that was inspired by Chavez and is you know, still fighting for his legacy today. And the thing is, some of Chavez's programs could have been sustainable if he pursued a sound economic policy and run a tight ship. But not only did he stop saving oil revenues in the rainy day fund, he also oversaw a government that Transparency International found to be the most corrupt country in Latin America. These programs could have been disdained if he ran a tight ship. And he cites Transparency International. Transparency International is an organization who has most of its funding coming from Western governments and big business. For example, one of the biggest donors is the British government, uh, contributing over a million pounds in 2007 alone. Uh, and its other major donors include the U.S. government, of course, very hostile to the Venezuelan government. And guess who else? Shell and ExxonMobil, the oil companies uh, that really want to have Venezuela's oil. And guess where the data came from in this report? It wasn't just that it was an organization funded by the enemy of Chavez and Maduro. The data in this report was actually compiled by an anti-Chavez activist who was actually part of the 2002 coup against Chavez. So not one to trust and use as a basis of your argument here, John. As long as the price of oil went up forever and Chavez never died, the cracks could have been papered over. Unfortunately, in 2014, the price of oil plummeted from over $100 a barrel to just $50 a barrel, just one year after Chavez plummeted from being alive to being very much dead. <laughs> and, and here is where Maduro, the big banana fan, comes in. But he says a lot of things here that need addressing. He's saying that Chavez's programs, which, you know, he can't deny were very good for Venezuela, he said they could only be sustained if the price of oil went up forever, as if they based everything in their economy completely on just counting on the fact that the price of oil was going to go up forever. They've known from the beginning that there needed to be a, a departure from oil. They had the first task of building up the oil industry and solving the urgent problems of poverty, and then using it to diversify the economy, build up other sectors of industry to not be a monocrop system. And this is something that was expressed uh, from the very outset of the Bolivarian Revolution is that they can't be simply reliant on oil, that they have to diversify the economy. So the other thing Solover says here is that the rise in standard of living and expansion of social programs could only happen if the price of oil went up forever and if Chavez stayed alive. But the thing is, is that since Chavez's death and since the price of oil has plummeted, the social programs have advanced and the social programs have been maintained. For example, since Chavez's death and since the plummeting of oil prices, a free quality healthcare has expanded to more of the country, making it available to people in historically uh, left behind and impoverished areas, in particular indigenous areas and the Amazons and so forth, causing the United Nations Program for Development to place Venezuela among the countries with the highest human development index in the world and surpassing most Latin American countries. Since Chavez's death and under Maduro, they reached the goal of building over 2 million new quality housing units for the poor. This is a massive feat in a very short period of time, and it's still moving forward, building about 500,000 new homes a year. And now today, Venezuela has the second lowest rate of homelessness in all of Latin America. Despite economic difficulties, 20,000 children's schools received new computers and made Venezuela rank sixth in the world in terms of enrollment in primary education with the highest literacy rate in all of Latin America. In fact, not only have they sustained and expanded these programs, but they've done it to a great degree. So for example, oil revenue has decreased by 87% and has still increased social investment. Socially invested resources in relation to income has gone from 39% to 74%. It's easy to see why Maduro has pissed people off, because he has managed Venezuela's economic crisis in the worst possible way. He's doubled down on many of Chavez's most unsound policies, like unrealistic currency and price controls, while attempting to make up for missing revenue by simply creating more money. And as a result, inflation has exploded. And inflation is just one of many reasons why, uh, uh, why many Venezuelans are struggling to find or even afford basic necessities like medicine or food. And those shortages have had some terrible consequences. Well, if that's just one of many reasons, what are the other reasons? Uh, he doesn't list any of them. Uh, well, here's a big one. An economic war that's undeniably being waged from within the country, from the biggest corporations, and from outside superpowers that have the ability to, you know, sanction the country, prevent it from getting loans, increasing the price of his foreign debt, and things like that. 
you'd think that would be worth mentioning. So we've covered these factors really extensively uh, in our reports on the Empire Files. I encourage people uh, to watch those for way more in-depth analysis of the problems of Venezuela's economy. But here's some important facts to know regarding inflation and regarding food shortages. So regarding inflation, 70% of the country's inflation is due to the rate of exchange with the U.S. dollar. This value of Venezuela's currency is arbitrarily determined by outside superpowers, mainly from Miami and Bogota. But perhaps the biggest cause of inflation is what's called extraction smuggling, where big capitalists, those who have the ability to have large sums of cash, actually smuggle cash out of the country, over the border, into Colombia and other places, and exchange them there. This reduces the amount of cash in the country and raises inflation. In addition to smuggling out cash to cause inflation, there's a huge amount of extraction smuggling of food products. In fact, 40% of products in the country are estimated to leave the country through extraction smuggling. And of course, these are things that are known to be tactics of big business owners in the country, opposition politicians, and the U.S. government for and to intentionally cause inflation. But of course, that isn't mentioned here in the report. Regarding food shortages, I mean, this is the number one thing we see, of course, the empty shelves on every single major media outlet. I did not see empty shelves anywhere. I saw a shortage of food. And I think if you are honest about Venezuela, you will acknowledge this fact. There is not a generalized shortage of food. There is a shortage of particular food products. And what do all those products have in common? Well, they're the ones that are produced and distributed by the biggest corporations and monopolies in the country who are literally part of the political movement to oust the government. For example, eight of the main items in Venezuela's food basket are foodstuffs that are produced by Polar, the country's biggest privately owned corporation and largest food manufacturer, which is run by a Trump-esque right-wing billionaire who is a known actor in efforts to overthrow the government. It's responsible for most of the country's butter, oil, and flour, which are the most consumed products among Venezuelans, and of course, the products that are of most in shortage. These companies produce the products, but refuse to release them to stores and into the economy. They instead keep them locked in their warehouses, refuse to let them out, or they send them out into the black market to be sold at an exorbitant markup, and of course also contribute to the rate of inflation uh, and price hikes. So the price controls that Oliver mentions as one of Chavez's most unsound policies is a response to this. When major corporations price gouge to intentionally make essential products out of reach to poor and working families, the government can either just let them do that or impose price controls and force discounts on the products so that people can get them. I'm sure the CEOs don't like that very much, uh, but that's a debate for another time. It is not like Maduro isn't aware that people are starving. In fact, during one of his media appearances, a reporter noticed that the video feed cut away every time Maduro helped himself to the plates of charcuterie and cakes. <laughs> Yeah, he just housed an empanada in front of a starving nation. And come on, Maduro, a nationwide famine is no time for fourth meal. My God, they caught Maduro eating food. What an outrage. You know, this narrative of a starving nation was really contradicted by Venezuelans I met who were actually living in the poorest areas. Pero no todo es lo que se refleja en los medios de comunicación. Yo tengo familia en Colombia y, y mi familia prácticamente a diario me escribe angustiada que mira que vente que y no le digo no mira pero no es como lo pintan allá o sea aquí no nos estamos muriendo de hambre un poco la comida si sí, se ha puesto escasa es por la guerra económica que nos están haciendo los opositarios las empresas privadas no colaboran en nada si hay comida en Venezuela aquí se garantizan las tres comidas los niños en la escuela tienen garantizada la comida totalmente gratis digo que es totalmente falso porque puedes ver que en los restaurantes de las mercedes en los restaurantes de mayor lujo aquí están llenos y si realmente estuviera pasando esa situación estuvieran esos restaurantes vacíos eh, la gente estuviera pidiendo comida en las calles y no está ocurriendo eso realmente so there's definitely more to the story there and if you think that is the most tone-deaf reaction to Venezuela's mass food shortages, just wait until you see him do some pretty insensitive crowd work. Why are you so skinny, Gustavo? Have you been jogging? What happened to him? <laughs> Maduro's diet. Even when the Maduro government has tried to help, it's done it in a truly ham-fisted way. For instance, Maduro has proposed a so-called rabbit's plan, basically a program to encourage Venezuelans to breed and eat bunnies. 
So the irony of this is he says the only time he's tried to help the hunger problem is in uh, ham-fisted ways. The irony is that he's speaking at a meeting of something called CLAP, which is a massive program by millions of farmers, activists all across the country to produce and distribute food to make sure every food insecure house has the basic necessities uh, that are in shortage because the big businesses are hoarding them. And because of that program, over 6 million households are receiving on a regular basis these basic food stuff so they're not food insecure and the program is expanding. And a thing about the rabbit plan. Of course, again, trying to characterize the Venezuelan government as just insane and crazy and who would come up with such a plan to eat bunnies. I'd find that there's actually dozens of countries. In fact, most industrialized countries have some kind of rabbit meat industries, uh, including Poland, Portugal, Hungary, Indonesia, Germany, Czech Republic, Belgium, Italy, Spain, France, and China being among the top. And you know who else is among the top producers of rabbit meat? The United States of America. Maduro has generally lived in complete denial. His most recent plan to address rampant inflation was to introduce a new version of their currency, the Bolivar, just with three zeros lopped off the end. <laughs> and in case any part of you thinks that might actually fix their inflation problem, we asked Yale economist Robert Schiller if that's how money works. Take a look. No, that's not how money works. <laughs> thanks, Robert, thanks. Uh... Maduro has lived in complete denial of the shortages and of inflation. Aside from this completely condescending clip of this esteemed Yale economist, uh, Venezuela's new currency is just one of many far-reaching plans to tackle the impact of the economic war on the country. This includes a new cryptocurrency called the petrodollar and more, far from the accusation that Maduro is in complete denial of the economic problems. Anyone who knows anything about Venezuelan politics knows that the inflation rate, the economic crisis, and the food shortages are the number one focus of the entire government and everyone who is politically active, stopping the economy of extraction smuggling, where all the trade routes of products and cash being snuck across the border. Another major action the Maduro government has taken on a regular basis is consistently raising the minimum wage in the country to keep up with inflation. The most recent was a nearly 60% wage increase, which followed a 40% wage increase and a 50% wage increase just months before. And in fact, the topic of virtually every speech that Maduro gives is how they're solving the problems of inflation, food shortages, and the economic war that's being waged against the country. But yeah, complete denial. In the, in the absence of solutions, Maduro has reached for the next best thing, blaming someone else. Over the years, he suggested that the United States was responsible for injecting Chavez with cancer. Oh my God, what an outrageous assertion that the United States may have assassinated uh, Chavez using cancer. We know for a fact that there have been numerous assassination plots against Chavez involving the United States. We know that Yasser Arafat was actually assassinated in the same way that Chavez died, uh, being poisoned with something that gave him a similar type of cancer. So it's really not that far-fetched of a thing. He said that the U.S. was sabotaging Venezuelan ATMs, and he's chalked up protest against him to this. This is part of a scheme of non-conventional war that the U.S. has perfected throughout recent decades. It's laughable for Maduro to say that the protests are a scheme backed by the United States, but the protests are openly funded by the United States government. In fact, $50 million of U.S. taxpayer dollars since 2009 alone have been sent to the opposition and to the protest leaders. Okay, so here's the thing there. America has undoubtedly done some awful things in Central and South America. We've backed coup attempts, uh, juntas, and atrocities uh, in Chile, Argentina, and Guatemala, but refreshingly, what's happening in Venezuela is actually not our fault. <laughs> accusing America of creating Venezuela's crisis is about as fair as accusing O.J. Simpson of murdering Princess Diana. <laughs> I'm not saying it would be completely out of character. It just happens to not be true in this particular instance. So that's, that's basically what I'm saying. Okay, so here we go. We've done bad things in Latin America before, but Venezuela is not our fault. It's possible, but it's not true in this situation, is what I'm saying. Okay, Jonathan, first of all, really appreciate the fact that this map was shown, and yet you acknowledge the fact that the U.S. has been a part of very terrible crimes in Latin America, but John Oliver's map has only three countries highlighted in all of Latin America. Well, he's missing a few. Actually, since 1890, the U.S. has been a part of 56 military interventions to determine who led the government in Latin America. 56. And it occurred in not just three countries, but in 17 out of the 33 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, the United States has intervened uh, to impose a form of government or a leader. And the only countries they didn't intervene in, they currently have military bases and troops on the ground there. 56 interventions and everything from assassinations to coups to all-out military invasions. 
But I don't expect John Oliver to know all of these 56 interventions and the 17 out of 33 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, but I was hoping that he would remember one particular intervention, and that is the coup in Venezuela. The U.S. supported that coup and continues to support the very same politicians who are part of the coup and express that they want to repeat the attempt. So, John Oliver, if you can acknowledge the record of U.S. intervention in the region and that we've done terrible things before, but just not in that instance, uh, how can you imagine that somehow today with that history, especially with a far-right administration led by the most hawkish neoconservatives, that the U.S. is simply not meddling in Venezuela's affairs right now? But we don't have to just speculate that that's what the U.S. wants to do. We know that's what the U.S. government has been pursuing for almost 20 years and still to this day. In fact, very recently, there's a numerous threats of military intervention to overthrow the government. On August 10th, President Donald Trump threatened a military option uh, in Venezuela if the election outcome wasn't what they wanted. Three days later, Mike Pence followed up saying, President Trump made it very clear that we will not stand by while Venezuela collapses into dictatorship, reaffirming this threat of a military option. In February, then Secretary of State Rex Tillerson openly called for a military coup. Uh, the same month, powerful Senator Marco Rubio also called for a military coup. And this was echoed by the main media organs of the U.S. government. Uh, from the Washington Post to Foreign Policy magazine, they ran op-eds openly calling for a military coup against the elected government government as the, quote, the best path to democracy. Not to mention, as we reviewed already, that we know the U.S. is funding destabilization efforts, meeting and coordinating with opposition leaders, and have been exposed for numerous regime change plots and actions since the one they failed at in 2002. Pretty big stuff to miss for the staff at last week tonight. Um, so these are not unfounded fears. This is a well-known reality. And yet, and yet, despite all of this, Maduro is about to dominate this election like he absolutely dominated that banana. <laughs> so how is that possible? Well, he's basically bent Venezuela's democratic process to his will. Now, I'm going to let John finish, but I had to stop and say how supremely arrogant this is. He cannot even fathom the possibility that Maduro can win the election because poor and working-class Venezuelans actually support him. Or it couldn't be that the country's opposition is unpopular, weak, and wrought with sectarian infighting, as it is. No, it must just be that he's a dictator and he's bent the democratic process to his will. Well, let's see how last week tonight substantiates this hefty accusation. Back in 2015, when his party lost control of the National Assembly, he responded by stacking the Supreme Court with 13 new justices and then simply created a whole new assembly. President Nicolás Maduro wants to create a political assembly with vast power to rewrite the Constitution and potentially dismantle the democratically elected legislature. All of the candidates today are Maduro supporters, including his wife and son. Now, just, just think about the sheer scale of what Maduro did there. That'd be like if here, Trump put a bunch of his friends on the Supreme Court, who then happily allowed him to create a second Congress that outranks the real Congress, and whose members include Melania and Eric, and which, by the way, you just know he'd call Dongress. You know he would do that. So this section is just so misleading and such a distortion of what is truly a democratic and participatory process in the country uh, that I have to spend a little more time uh, explaining what actually happened here. Because these are really heavy accusations that Maduro lost control of one branch of government, even though he saw the executive branch, uh, and so dissolved it and created uh, through, you know, dictatorial means this entire new body of government. Here's what really happened. Here's a quick rundown. So Chavez was elected to power in 1999 on the basis of creating a new constitution. That's what he was voted for, and that's what he did when he was elected. When he took power, he started a process of drafting a new constitution. The way that this was done was millions of Venezuelans all across the country had mass meetings, discussions, debates, and proposed things to be in the constitution. Drafts of the constitution went out. People amended them, discussed them, debated them. Uh, and then ultimately, this constitution, new constitution that was created organically and democratically by the people, was put to a national vote. And among the voters that came out, over 70% of voters approved this constitution. And Article 347 of that constitution that was democratically created and adopted reads as follows, quote, the Venezuelan people are the depository of the original constituent power, and the exercise of that power 
it can convene a national constituent assembly with the purpose of transforming the state, creating a new legal system, and drafting a new constitution. And so the creation of this constituent assembly was completely within the bounds of the constitution that the people created and passed through a democratic vote in overwhelming numbers. And now the constituent assembly, as John Oliver likes to say, he just created it, stacked it with all his people, his, his relatives, and it was a sham vote. But the constituent assembly process was a democratic process that took many, many months and, and initiated a long, in-depth democratic process. I personally witnessed mass meetings that were held all across the country in the months in the lead up to the nomination of candidates and the election of people to the constituent assembly. Every citizen could go to meetings, understand what the constituent assembly was about, how to run, how to vote. And every citizen, everybody and anybody could run as delegates. The idea that Maduro stacked them with his own people, only Maduro people went, is a complete fabrication. Everybody and anybody was welcome to run as delegates, including the opposition, but the opposition refused to participate. In fact, the government wanted the Constituent Assembly to be a way for dialogue between the opposition and Chavistas. And the government actually begged opposition members to run for the Constituent Assembly, but they refused to take part in this process. So that's why there was mostly Maduro supporters. Of course, it wasn't all Maduro supporters who ran for the Constituent Assembly, but it was majority Maduro supporters because everyone who opposed Maduro refused to take part in the democratic process. And then a popular vote of 8 million people came out to elect delegates. There was over 6,000 candidates across the country and 545 delegates were elected to this constituent assembly. And while this process was clearly legal and constitutional, it's important to know why it all happened. Oliver claims that this whole charade was just to dictatorially keep Maduro in office, who was just clinging to power through force and manipulations like the constituent assembly. First of all, that makes no sense since the Constituent Assembly has nothing to do with the presidential election, and Maduro had to win in a general election despite his supporters dominating the Constituent Assembly. So why did this whole thing really happen? Well, there are three big reasons. The first reason was to bring a peaceful resolution to the conflict in the country. It was announced while the opposition was organizing violent street blockades, shutting down the country and causing a lot of death and destruction. They said that Maduro was no longer legitimate and that he and the Socialist Party had to step down from office before their democratically elected term ended. The Constituent Assembly was an attempt to resolve all of these grievances peacefully, democratically, and in a dialogue. In fact, the slogan of the campaign was Constituent Assembly for Peace. This also called the opposition's bluff. If they really were so popular, and the socialists had lost support of the people, then it should be easy for them to run and take over the Constituent Assembly and change the Constitution however they wanted. The opposition's boycott speaks volumes there. The second reason is because the National Assembly, which had been controlled by the opposition since 2015, as John Oliver mentioned, had been acting as an agent of sabotage to maximize the impact of the economic crisis, shut down certain government functions, and actually operating outside the bounds of the law. For example, they are held in contempt for unconstitutionally appointing dozens of judges to form an alternative Supreme Court to override the decisions of the actual Supreme Court. The opposition National Assembly was in breach of Supreme Court rulings for the past two years and had not passed any legislation during that time. In particular, legislation necessary to resolve economic issues. You see why the government needed the Constituent Assembly to get around the National Assembly's blockade. Also, the National Assembly could have worked in tandem with the new Constituent Assembly, but they refused the offer. And third, the point of the Constituent Assembly and its task of changing the Constitution was to enshrine certain social and political rights that were not in the original Constitution. For example, a major sector who ran for the Assembly was activists and the LGBTQ community, so that rights for gay and trans people could be enshrined in the new Constitution. Same goes for environmental activists, who ran to ensure that rights for the planet were added to the Constitution. Very sinister stuff, huh? But mainly, this factor sought to enshrine many of the social missions that improve the lives of so many millions of people in ways that we've already covered. From housing to education, the opposition was very clear in saying that it wanted to eliminate these very popular programs that help millions and millions of poor people. So putting new protections in the Constitution would make that more difficult if the opposition were to take power. All of these things seem very reasonable, democratic, and constitutional. While the opposition was free and even encouraged to be part of it, they refused. They refused because they wanted the narrative to be exactly the one that John Oliver gave, a complete and utter lie to delegitimize a government that exercises far more democracy than the United States does. Now, on top of that, Maduro has either jailed or barred from public office a number of his political opponents. And it is true. These three people have either been barred from running for office or jailed. Uh, let's look at who they are. The first one 
is Henry Capriles. Capriles is a rabidly anti-gay politician who ran for president against Maduro in 2013. So he wasn't barred from running then. And with an 80% voter turnout, he was indisputedly defeated by Maduro. And that's how Maduro became president the first time. It's also notable that he ran in that presidential election after he was part of the short-lived coup d'etat that kidnapped Chavez in 2002. He was recently barred from holding office for his proven role in the Odebrecht scandal. Odebrecht is Latin America's biggest construction company and part of a massive international corruption investigation, which involves it in paying hundreds of millions of dollars in bribes. Capriles was governor, 2011-2013. Uh, he was part of this scandal and funneling money uh, from the scandal into himself and his party. So that's why he's barred from running. The next guy is Leopoldo Lopez, a far-right opposition leader uh, who's on house arrest right now uh, for nothing big, just for being tried and convicted for planning and organizing and leading a violent coup attempt against a democratic government in 2014 that ended up claiming the lives of 43 people. He was not, however, ever charged for his role in the deadly failed coup attempt in 2002, where he actually led the illegal kidnapping of government officials when the right wing took over the government undemocratically. Hard to imagine anyone avoiding charges after that first one, uh, but yeah, after the second try, he was placed on house arrest. Then there's Antonio Ledesma. And what was he arrested for? Well, in February 2015, a coup plot was uncovered, yet another coup plot. And Ledesma was found to be a lead organizer of that coup. And what were discovered in this plans for a coup? Oh, just assassinating Maduro and then installing a junta government and even bombing several civilian targets, including bombing the state-owned media offices of Telesur. He also, like Leopoldo Lopez and Henrique Capriles, was part of the coup in 2002. So I'm pretty sure these people would be barred from running an election in any country. And it's extremely ironic that John Oliver is saying Venezuela's democracy is illegitimate because the democratic rights were taken away for three men who multiple times tried to undemocratically overthrow an elected popular government with violence to eliminate the democratic rights of the Chavez movement. And then the funny thing about the claim here that Maduro barred political opponents is I'm pretty sure that political opponents ran against him in the election. When the presidential election was announced, the opposition coalition, or MUD, was split over running. While a democratic victory was possible for them, they favored a different strategy. Rather than risk an electoral defeat and showing that the opposition didn't have popular support over Maduro, they'd rather have Maduro run unopposed. That way they could deem the election illegitimate and seize power from Maduro by way of coup or foreign intervention. But in February, leading opposition politician Henry Falcone registered to run against Maduro. The MUD immediately expelled him, and demand he withdraw from the election. The US government was even exposed for privately pressuring Falcone to drop out of the race. So there's this claim that the opposition wasn't allowed to run against Maduro, but the opposition and the US government, in fact, pursued a policy of not running against him to create the illusion that you couldn't run against him. But Falcone screwed up the plan for them and showed that you could run. But then on election day, the opposition largely boycotted the vote. Less than 2 million people came out to vote for Falcone, and he was beaten by Maduro by a margin of over 4 million votes. Immediately afterwards, the US and opposition leaders said that the loss of Falcone didn't count, and then there should be new elections, and those new elections should bar Maduro from running. Very democratic. And has even turned down help from other countries and agencies, including food and medicine. He has turned down food and medicine, telling Venezuelans that humanitarian aid is part of a conspiracy to overthrow his government. That's absolutely untrue. They've received help and aid from many other governments, including Cuba, Iran, China, Russia, Turkey, India, and more. But what they have not done is accept help from the United States government through USAID. First of all, as we already know, the U.S. government has the express desire of overthrowing the government and regime change. So I don't think it's unfounded that they thought that the aid could come in the form of uh, trying to forward that agenda. USAID is a known tool of regime change. In fact, in one example of nearby in Cuba, USAID was exposed for having a fake social media campaign, infiltrating community hip hop groups to recruit agents, and had a fake HIV program to gather data for regime change purposes. USAID has a long history of open regime change efforts in countries. It's not that they're not accepting aid. They're just not accepting aid from the people that want to overthrow them through the agency that is known to be a tool to overthrow them. All of which has left Venezuelans feeling so hopeless that nearly one million of them have left the country over the past two years. And many of those who've remained are now at their breaking point. That's absolutely horrifying. And when you listen to her, it starts to hit you that poo-poo-toff cocktails might actually turn out to be pretty fucking restrained. 
So if you speak out, they send militias to kill you. That's a pretty hefty claim. You think there would be some evidence you could cite for this. In fact, it seems like you can speak out against the government since uh, that woman and large massive demonstrations and uh, people all over the country are speaking out against the government and not being uh, killed by militias. Uh, but what we do, in fact, see uh, is the opposite. Uh, now, I was there in Venezuela during the height of the protest movement in April through June. There were 13 political murders and assassinations of Chavistas and government supporters by the opposition. Five were targeted for just attending a pro-government demonstration. Two were figures in Maduro's party who were kidnapped, tortured, and then executed by the opposition. But of course, we'll just say it's uh, if you speak out against the government, you're killed. Um, they attacked pro-government journalists, uh, dousing one with gasoline and shooting a reporter for Telesur in the back. Um, and most chilling was the lynching of 21-year-old Orlando Figueroa, uh, who is Afro-Venezuelan, who is brutally beaten, stabbed, and then burned alive by a crowd of hundreds of opposition protesters who, according to an interview with Orlando in the hospital before he died, they were yelling, hey, black guy, see what happens to Tavistas uh, before they threw Molotov cocktails on him and doused him with incendiary fluid. So they also burned three other people alive uh, during the course of those protests. So for John Oliver to say that that's pretty fucking restrained is a major problem. They're obviously not just armed with Pupatov cocktails, they're armed with guns, rocket launchers, bombs, and of course, Molotov cocktails that they've used uh, to not only incinerate police officers, uh, but burn alive people just for supporting the government and for th crimes such as, you know, uh, being black. During that same time period of the months I was talking about, there were 57 deaths attributed to opposition protesters. Uh, everything's from shooting uh, to lynchings, in addition to killing people over their political beliefs. Um, you know, supposedly for people who are riding over food, obviously Opposition protesters have actually attacked and burned down food storage facilities containing tons of food instead of looting them for the food. Uh, quite interesting. They've attacked women's maternity wards, causing uh, newborn infants and mothers to have to flee the hospital because it was a government hospital. They've beaten public bus drivers and burned their buses. Anything that's a symbol of the government's social programs uh, have been attacked burned down, destroyed, and even people killed in some, in some of these incidents. This movement, although there are many legitimate sectors, are dominated by far-right, racist politics, large-scale killings, political intimidation, and destruction of infrastructure designed to make life in Venezuela more difficult with the open and expressed desire, which I witnessed firsthand, to create a media spectacle so that the U.S. military can come into the country and do what they know they cannot do on their own as a weak minority in the country oust a democratic government by force of violence. So if that is pretty fucking restrained, I worry what Oliver hopes will happen there. And the most frustrating thing here is there aren't a lot of great options to help. The Trump administration has imposed some sanctions and is considering more, but if they're not extremely careful, those could wind up causing even more hardship. So, so for John Oliver to say there's not a lot of options to help, he's talking about actions that the U.S. can take to uh, change the government in the country. But he says the sanctions that Trump has passed, that this is somehow well-meaning by the Trump administration, but he just has to be careful not to hurt average Venezuelans. These are the express purpose of these sanctions. These are all economic attacks designed to prevent their economy from recovering. The very things John Oliver says he wants to see happen in Venezuela so Venezuela can prosper. And even this idea that the U.S. needs to do something to help Venezuela and that the Venezuelan people are not the ones that should shape their own destiny is the height of imperial arrogance. At this point, seeing as Maduro won't listen to reason or to the will of his own people, what John Oliver means is he's not listening to the will of the people who are a minority in the country, who refuse to run in elections, who refuse to vote, who refuse to engage in all of the open democratic processes that are available to them, refuse invitations to negotiate and collaborate with the government to have their demands met, and who are demanding that instead the democratic government step down and reverse all of the social gains that the majority of people support. That's who he's not listening to. Not to mention that Maduro wants to talk and listen to them. Maduro and the government before the election on May 20th and after his victory in his victory speech has done nothing but invite the opposition movement into a dialogue, into negotiations, and into the, into the different processes that are available to have their grievances heard and to try to appease some sector of the population. They are the ones that have refused to speak with the government and instead demand intervention from foreign imperial powers to impose an unpopular government on the people. Maduro won't listen to the will of his own people. If you know anything about Venezuela, you know that Chavismo and the socialist movement is a mass movement that would exist whether or not Maduro is there. They have made him their representative. 
but so many millions of Venezuelans are active participants in the political process. There's such an effervescence of grassroots organizing and participation uh, that to say that Maduro somehow is sitting in a tower as a dictator and not taking into consideration the existence of these people is completely absurd. And these are people that are supporting the government because for centuries were made invisible and were made to have no role in the outcome of their country. And since Chavez have been given a voice, have been made visible, and have been made the leaders of their own country and are the ones shaping their future. And what John Oliver is trying to do here is make them invisible again. Perhaps it's time to call in the one voice that we know he'll listen to. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a bird. The point is, Maduro, you need to accept humanitarian aid and, and cool it with the dictator stuff. And that's how he concludes this full-length episode. So it's clear from every fact that Oliver puts out in this report uh, that he doesn't actually know what's going on in Venezuela. In fact, the writers of his show either don't know what's going on in Venezuela or actively have an agenda. The reason for doing this, you know, is because John Oliver sees himself as a progressive person and progressive-minded people uh, watch this show. If you're finding yourself on the same side as Trump, Nikki Haley, and their political equivalents in Venezuela, uh, you have to re-examine your position. And John Oliver and his writers didn't even bother to look behind the headlines to hear from the millions of Venezuelans who don't just support the government, but who are the living, breathing builders of the Bolivarian project. If Oliver wants to be a progressive voice, a voice against Trump, he shouldn't be advancing the Trump administration's fantasy in Venezuela, and more importantly, rendering invisible what is a massive progressive movement, fighting racism, fighting inequality, fighting for the poor, fighting for the right of people to have health care, the right to equality education, for workers' rights, union rights, and environmental rights, solving problems through grassroots democracy, and all of the nice things John Oliver claims he's for. Yet he reduces this mass poor and working class social movement to cartoonish jokes, joins the Trump administration in attacking them, and gives the spotlight to a far-right, unpopular opposition and their thoroughly debunked propaganda points while completely whitewashing the terrible violence and hardship that they and the U.S. government have been inflicting on the country. If you consider yourself a progressive, you must reject this kind of colonialist finger-wagging and stand with the progressive Bolivarian movement in Venezuela who are fighting for the same things we are against the Trumps of Venezuela.